He craved the answers, understandings beyond his imagination, the revelations that would finally put his curiosity to rest. In the pursuit of the Black Book, he had given it all. His fortune, family, his friends, his honor. None was worth withholding when the prize was this great. A strange warmth met his palm as he brushed the cover. Dust puffed into the air, the smell of wet mold filled his nostrils. He had come this far, given so much. Now was not the time for cowardice and second thoughts. He threw open the book and the cover thumped against the plinth. The pages were littered with words of a thousand unreadable languages crawling from edge to edge. Wet ink smeared across his fingers as he touched the page. Smudged letters slid from underneath them only to regain shape or flow into the black sinkholes. Then the pages rippled like a still lake disturbed by a stone. Tendrils burst before his eyes, grasping his neck and arms with a strength that slid and tightened to his every move to resist it. His face was pulled closer to the page. The waves of letters moved at dizzying speeds. More tendrils emerged and slid their inked tips into the openings of his ears, worming their way into the corners of his mind, seeding it with the inevitable, the contradictory, and the unthinkable. The raw knowledge, without an intellect capable of processing or an ethos of denial, it was unbearable. Many a mind has been ruined in this fashion. The Isle of Solstheim is home to some of them, those that desire the answers of Hermaeus Mora. The Daedric Prince of Knowledge, Master of Tides and Fate, Hermaeus Mora. He is recognized as the Abyssal Cephaliarch, ruler of Apocrypha, a golden eye of many tendrilled and varied forms, always presenting himself as an inky mass of sea creature anatomy, watchful eyes bulge from his body, eager to see, to record, to know. The Book of the Daedra says it is his whose sphere is scrying of the tides of fate, of the past and future as read in the stars and heavens, and in whose dominion are the treasures of knowledge and memory. The tides of fate. Keep that in mind, because you'll often find allegories of the sea and the ocean with Hermaeus Mora present in his realm, his lesser Daedra, and his very own appearances. This, I believe, is intentional, and later I will show you why, but first there are some other titles this Lord of Knowledge possesses, titles that reveal his potential origins. Ur Daedra is a description of Hermaeus Mora that has been used by his very own seekers, nonetheless. In reference to other princes such as Namira and Nocturnal, the term Erdra has been used, which is likely a shortened and more phonetically pleasing version of the term Ur Daedra. So from now on, I'll simply just use Erdra. Ur means primitive, original, the earliest, and when combined with Daedra, it gives us Erdra. With this, we can understand that those with this title are among the eldest and most powerful Daedric princes. Furthermore, Hermaeus Mora is also in the Fragmente Abyssum Hermaeus Morus, called Elder Then Arda. The Et Arda were the original spirits, those that predated the creation of Mundus, and to be older than them, well, that statement and his status as an Erdra, as well as the other title Old Antecedent, antecedent meaning a thing that existed before, I feel it's very safe to assume that Hermaeus Mora is very, very old. It could also mean that by being older than Arda, Hermaeus is simply older than divine spirits such as the likes of Morahouse and Pelennor Whitestrake. In writings about them, the term Arda is used to describe themselves, and the term here indicates that they are descended from and not as powerful as the Et Arda. It's worth considering that this is what was intended by the phrase Elder Than Arda. In an unofficial source, Imperial Census of the Daedra Lords by Michael Kirkbride, it is said that Hermaeus Mora, the gardener of men, claims that he is one of the oldest princes born of thrown away ideas used during the creation of mortality in the Mundus. Imperial Mananauts have verified that his influence on fate and time is real and unfeigned, implications of which tie this prince directly with Akatosh, chief of the Nine Divines. Since Akatosh is the prime temporal spirit whose appearance led to the formation of the world, perhaps Hermaeus Mora speaks the truth. This unofficial source conceives of Hermaeus Mora as one of the oldest princes, which stacks up with all the official sources where he is stated as elder than Arda and called Old Antecedent, and it's an interesting idea that he was born from thrown away ideas during the creation of mortality. However, that description to me at least makes him seem younger than someone who is stated as Ur Daedra, one of the eldest, primeval, and first Daedric entities predating the creation of Mundus by what I assume would be Aeons. So while it's a cool idea, I don't pay it too much mind. 
However, one of the more exciting propositions in this piece is the direct connection between Akatosh and Hermaeus Mora. Akatosh created time, and with temporal laws come sequence, events one after the other, some would say fate. There is much more to explore here, especially with the origins of Mirak, but I fear we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let us first ground our understanding of Hermaeus Mora with his earliest recorded interactions within the world. In the aforementioned book Fragmente Abyssum Hermaeus Morris, an ancient Atmoran myth is described, providing us with one of the earliest accounts of the Daedric Prince that they call Herma Mora, the Woodland Man, a title by which is another interesting rabbit hole of speculation we shall pursue soon. But the myth speaks of Isgrimor when he still lived lived on Atmora. Isgrimor was out hunting game in the Atmoran Frostwood when he spied the white stag of Forlgrim. He made pursuit, and again and again he lost sight of his quarry. Isgrimor lost the trail once more and stopped, sore and vexed. Then a hare appeared and spoke. It told him that he knows where the stag is, and he knows because he has long ears. And it was said that if Isgrimor had long ears too, then he could hear his prey wherever it went to. Isgrimor asked the hare to grant him long ears, and with a twitch of its nose he felt his ears begin to grow and point, when suddenly a fox leapt out and slew the hare, and Isgrimor's ears remained short. The fox spoke, Know thou mortal that I am sure, and this was nary hare, but indeed Herma Mora, who did nearly trick thee into becoming of elven kind. Rely you hereafter, mortal, upon the forthright methods of man, and eschew the tricks of the elves, lest ye become one. Now go, for the white stag awaiteth thee in the vale. And that is the tale of how Hermaeus Mora nearly tricked Isgrimor into becoming an elf. According to the varieties of faith, there are many other stories about Isgrimor escaping the wiles of old Hermamora, the Atmoran demon of knowledge, but what I find most interesting is that he is named the Woodland Man by the Nords, but this is a name the Wood Elves know Hermamora by. To the Bosma, the Woodland Man is a malicious trickster spirit, which also sounds similar to the Atmoran Hermamora. However, the Bosmeri cultists that follow him do not believe he is the same as the Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora, to which most others see as a misguided assertion. But how is it that both the Bosma of Valenwood and those Nords of ancient Atmora, elves and men from land masses of south and extreme north, ended up with the same names and perceptions of Herma Mora? the woodland man, a trickster spirit. Possibly there was some cross-cultural pollination that went on in the earliest days of the First Era. The Nords had arrived in Skyrim centuries prior at the time of the Elysian Rebellion, year 242 of the First Era, and they were of vital importance in supporting the rebellion against the Aelid Elves, so much so that the Eight Divines Faith was formulated as a synthesis of Nordic and Elven pantheons. It is very possible that in this time, cults of Hermamora found sway among the Nidics of Nibine, who in history Ford would be known as the Nibonese, a Cyrodiilic people defined by their magic, spiritualism, and many cults. The newly forged empire experienced short of 100 years free of the Elysian Order and their doctrines, the zealous anti-Elven faction that would become synonymous with the First Empire for the rest of its history. But in that short period of bliss before them, the Elysian Empire had made a trade treaty with Valenwood in 340, which I can presume ended by 361 when the Elysian doctrines were enforced by law. However, 20 years, I think, is enough time for these cults of Hermamora to spread into Valenwood via Cyrodiil. Just a guess. But back to the prince himself, it is worth noting that in Elnifex, the tongue of the Elnifei, that is the root language of almost all spoken languages with the exception of Gel, the Argonian language, Mora means wood or forest, depending on context. So in Vardenfell, the town of Balmora means stonewood, or Sadrith Mora means forest of the mushrooms. Atmora translates to Elder Wood, and if we were to look at the Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora, well, then we can know it means Hermaeus Wood or Hermaeus Forest, likely where we get the title Woodland Man from. As for the Hermaeus part of the name, I think that's simply his name, but you could forgive me a little speculative tangent and we could look at some of the real world inspiration for clarity. Now, there is Hermaeus, an Indo-Greek king of the Eratid dynasty, but I don't think there is much there other than the name. However, the Herm part of Hermaeus or 
Hermer sounds quite similar to Hermes, the Greek god, who is similarly regarded as a divine trickster, which is similar in this regard to the trickster understanding of Hermaeus that both the Nords and Bosma possess. However, I would suggest that maybe instead it is a nod to Hermes Trismegistus, the supposed author of the Hermetica, which lays the foundational philosophy for Hermeticism, an ancient philosophical pseudo-religious type tradition with a history that dates back to late antiquity, and it has had great inspirations on symbols and systems such as tarot, astrology, and alchemy. The Elder Scrolls universe draws on a lot of Hermetic influence for its world building, and if you're interested, it's a fascinating realm of inquiry, but the takeaway here is, or at least I think so, is that the name Hermaeus is meant to stimulate similar feelings as to when one hears Hermetic. By the way, Junal, the Nordic version of Julianos, is said to be a god of Hermetic orders. What they are exactly in the Elder Scrolls universe is never really explained, but perhaps these Hermetic orders were dedicated to Hermamora in some capacity. Anyways, thanks for indulging me, let's get back to the more solid in-universe connections. So Hermaeus Mora. Mora means wood. He had or has a presence in Valenwood and at Mora, aka the Elder Wood. He is known by both cultures as the Woodland Man, and there is likely some symbolic connection here somewhere, but I'm not sure we can get anything definitive with this avenue of thought. But I think it's worth bringing up because this seems to be one of the rare exceptions where Hermaeus Mora is represented in a way not associated with the sea or the aquatic, but instead he's associated with wood or forests and is given a kind of trickster element to him. I'm interested to see what you have to say on the matter in the comments below, but there is one little tidbit from the varieties of faith about Hermaeus Mora. Also called the Demon of Knowledge, he is vaguely related to the cult origins of the Morag Tong, Forester's Guild, if only by association with his brother sister Mephala. Here Hermaeus Mora is stated to be the brother sister of Mephala, and it is interesting that the Morag Tong translates to Forester's Guild, a guild of assassins devoted to Mephala, whose brother is Hermaeus Mora, whose name means Hermaeus Wood or Hermaeus Forest. A forester is either reference to the medieval sheriff-like role of an individual who protected woodlands for a noble, stopping things like poaching, and perhaps this is something like the Morag Tong protecting the knowledge forest, so to say, from poaching, aka guarding secrets. Or rather, the forester definition is one that pertains to looking after a forest and planting new trees and maintaining it. Perhaps an analogy for planting new secrets, aka knowledge, and becoming caretakers of those secrets. This next tidbit is somewhat a tangent, but I thought it best to bring up now. One of Hermaeus Mora's artifacts are Mora's Whispers, a pair of pauldrons with living eyes which allow the bearer to learn faster and grow literally more powerful with the more knowledge you accumulate. The reason I thought to bring this up right now is because I reckon they would look really cool on a Morag Tong assassin, especially with the lore angle of the Forester's Guild that we have been discussing, but let's get back to it. Despite the explicit drawn connection between Hermaeus Mora and Mephala, thematically both of these princes are tied to secrets and both are tied to causality. Also, Mephala is, in the monomyth, regarded as one of the earliest recognizable spirits after Akatosh's formation, which aligns with Hermaeus Mora, her brother, being an Erdra, and we could assume the term also fits Mephala. Now, remember, we have an interesting line of thought to follow with Akatosh and his relation to Hermaeus Mora, and seemingly by extension Mephala, all of which have some fundamental interaction with time and causality, but the best place to start would be with the infamous Mirak, he who turned against the dragons, he who sought power, which led him into the hands of Hermaeus Mora. Mirak was the first dragonborn to ever live. A dragon priest of the Morethic era, he turned against his winged overlords and harnessed the power of the Bend Will Shout, taught to him by Hermaeus Mora himself, forcing the dragons to heed his thumb. In battle with Varlok the Jailer, he was defeated, nearly about to be killed, but was saved at the last moment by Hermaeus Mora, snatched into his realm of Apocrypha. Mirak was never seen again, until the last dragonborn would emerge in the 201st year of the Fourth Era. Traditionally, the slave queen Alicia was the first to bear the dragon blood, and its purpose was to fulfill her side of the Akatosh Covenant, where he would keep the firm barriers between Mundus and Oblivion, as long as an heir of the dragon blood sat upon the throne. For thousands of years, dragonborn emperors were the only with any form of claim to the rulership of the Imperial Domain, until Martin Septim, the last of his kind sacrificed himself to manifest as a divine avatar of Akatosh and defeat Meirun's Dagon. 
For 200 years, the pitiless march of time would continue until again a dragonborn would appear to right the wrongs of Alduin, who had been sent forward in time from the late Marethic era. The important takeaway here is that the dragonborn always seems to have some kind of preordained purpose, one dictated by Akatosh. As for Mirak, there is probably the more generally accepted theory that he was made dragonborn by Akatosh for the purposes of defeating Alduin in the Marethic Era, when the tyrant dragon first shirked his duties as world eater and instead chose to rule the world as a tyrant. But with the allure of power, it would seem that Mirak too cast aside his destined purpose to instead pursue an avenue other than Akatosh intended. Alduin gets sent forward in time by the ancient Nords to be someone else's problem, and in the fourth era, Akatosh works his blessings once more, and the last dragonborn appears and fulfills the duty that supposedly Mirak was supposed to fulfill. That is one idea, and I think it's rather neat, but what if Mirak was never supposed to be dragonborn? What if it was Hermaeus Mora that gave him the power? We know Hermaeus has extensive knowledge of the Thum. After all, he taught Mirak the powerful Bend Wilshout. What if there was more to it, though? Allow me a moment of speculation here, but Hermaeus Mora's sphere is forbidden knowledge and the scrying of tides of fate, of the past and future as read in the stars of heaven. Mora has at the very least insights into the future, and perhaps some of these insights give him the knowledge of the dragon blood. We must also understand that time as it is experienced in the waters of oblivion is different to that of time on Mundus, and also that gods experience time differently to mortals. The tribunal god Vivek says as much in his response to the Nerevrine, asking what it's like to be a god. It's a bit like being at once awake and asleep. Awake, I am here with you, thinking and talking. Asleep, I am very, very busy. Perhaps for the other gods, the completely immortal ones, it is only like that being asleep, out of time. Me, I exist at once inside of time and outside of it. It's nice never being dead too. When I die in the world of time, then I am completely asleep. I'm very much aware that all I have to do is choose to wake, and I'm alive again. Many times I have deliberately tried to wait patiently, a very long, long time before choosing to wake up, and no matter how long it feels like I wait, it always appears when I wake up that no time has passed at all. That is, the God place, the place out of time, where everything is always happening all at once. And Azura said to the tribunal when they had betrayed her, what you have done here today is foul beyond measure, and you will grow to regret it, for the lives of gods are not what mortals think, and matters that weigh only years to mortals weigh on gods forever. I think both in how gods experience the flow of time and the fact that Hermaeus Mora has knowledge of events to come in the future, then it's perhaps possible that Hermaeus Mora dipped his tendrils into said future and foresaw the pact with Elysia, the Akatosh Covenant, and took that knowledge and bestowed it upon his champion Mirak. I don't think it's implausible considering that within Apocrypha, forbidden knowledge regarding the Godhead can be found, knowledge of a concept far more groundbreaking than the blessing of the Dragonblood. Side note, the Book of the Dragonborn is the in-game text that you want to read if you're confused as to how the Dragonborn status works, but it's not a simple matter of hereditary, and it requires the blessing of Akatosh himself. So, is it possible that Hermaeus Mora somehow learned of Akatosh's Dragonborn blessing and was able to gift this power to his chosen champion? I think it's surely possible, but not certain. Perhaps it was Akatosh who made Mirak Dragonborn, and Hermaeus Mora who foresaw Mirak's coming chose to influence him with the promise of greater power. To bust my own bubble, why would Hermaeus Mora seek out Dragonborn champions specifically if he had the capacity to make them himself? Even if the theory that the power to become Dragonborn was not some forbidden knowledge kept in Apocrypha's vast libraries gleaned from the scrying of the future, still we must recognize Hermaeus Mora's reach and capacity for finding secrets past, present, and future. And further, we must recognize the depths of knowledge contained within the vast mind of Hermaeus Mora. His realm is Apocrypha, the infinite archives of oblivion where impossible knowledge is contained, a realm of vast ink seas from where spires of stacked books spiral their way to green skies where apparitions of Mora flail their tentacles and watch with his many eyes. Pages flutter by in spirals, lurkers, the towering monstrosities with gaping mouths of needle-like teeth emerge to melt the flesh of trespassers with their acid spit. Seekers float as grotesque masses of tentacles, masters of duplicitous magic, vanishing and employing mirror images to distract you while they slowly sap your strength. Even if you escape the moors of its guardians, you must contend with the 
lengthening hallways, vanishing paths, and sudden dead ends. Bridges unfurl and paths shift. Urns are everywhere, each filled with a broth of noisome fluid in where a living brain is contained, excised from its original host, perhaps the fate of those who are captured or those who make the wrong deal. With Hermaeus Mora, there is clearly an aquatic theme for the most part, himself always presenting as an amalgamation of deep sea monstrosity and his realm an ocean of ink. And for the Khajiit, this is near literal, where they believe that Hermaeus Mora, Hermora as he is called to them, records all the events he perceives and stores them away in a great library under the sea. While on the topic of the Khajiit, it's also worth noting that in their mythology, Hermora has a close relationship with Azura, who visits his library often, and Hermora is described as a patient spirit who helped Azura maintain the moons and their motions, which I think is a fun allusion to how the gravitational pull of the moon affects the tides, in our real world at least. I mentioned before that this aesthetic design may be an intentional association because water in the Elder Scrolls stores memory. There are many allegories and allusions to such a fact throughout the lore, all of which can be extrapolated elsewhere, but some of the more concrete explanations come from one of the primeval seekers, a cult devoted to Hermaeus Mora himself. A Dromora woman named Harold Kixarthi was one of these primeval seekers. She even claims that Hermaeus Mora taught her how to sever her ties to oblivion and bind herself to Mundus, another example of Mora's extensive knowledge and capability. He possesses the knowledge to sever a Daedra from their binds to oblivion, something unheard of. Kixarthi was trying to stop a Nereid named Lorelia from accessing an ancient shrine that could alter the laws of reality. The Nereid had learned one of the most dangerous secrets about the natural order, and when pressed, Kixarthi says this, No point in hiding it now. When a mortal dies, where do you think their memories go? Don't bother guessing. I'll tell you. They go into the water. They become water. All the memories of Tamriel's history are stored in its waters. All life, every conscious being, is created in the water of the womb, or an egg, and within their bodies is the precious water that is blood. These waters contain memory, and when liberated from the body, they return to the rivers, the rains, the oceans. With this understanding, we gain greater clarity as to why Hermaeus Mora is strongly associated with the aquatic. While Apocrypha's infinite libraries of knowledge swell with pages and tomes, its inky waters are likely rich with the memories collected, a depth of experience procured over generations, over millennia, over Kalpas. It is interesting that this is never really spoken about. When discussing the Daedric Prince, we often hear of his books, his libraries, his acquisition of forbidden secrets, but memories, experience captured by his watery grasp. We must consider this when looking at his motivations. Perhaps he desires certain minds for the experience that they have had, the memories they possess. I suppose it's the difference between theory and practicality. Books possess synthesized knowledge, whereas memory, that is the tactile experience, the knowledge of the moment, that feeling. Practice makes perfect is not a function of the theoretical, but it is the perfect memory of a move that allows a swordsman to draw upon it without conscious thought. I wonder if the memories of the last Dragonborn may be of value to Hermaeus Mora. We can speculate further on, but before we rush ahead, let us lay all the pieces on the board. We have yet to speak of the Black Books or the Ogma Infinium, or any of his other artifacts that may further prove Hermaeus Mora's power to be more than previous thought. Historically, the most famous of his artifacts is the Ogma Infinium. Leather-bound and stitched with the skin of elven races, this tome was written by the scribe of Oriel, Xarxes, elven god of secrets and hidden knowledge, he who kept track of all Aldmeri accomplishments, large and small. Xarxes cares for lineage and heritage, the keeper of the records that link the Ultima to their ancestors, clearly a man with the love of the historical, so much so that he created his wife, Ogma, from his favourite moments in history. Xarxes wrote the Ogma Infinium, named after his wife, with knowledge he gained from Hermaeus Mora. Mora claims that Xarxes was in fact a loyal servant of his, a claim that would certainly send discord throughout elven society if ever broadly known. Use of this powerful tome confers near demigod capabilities of either the path of steel, shadow, or spirit. Like most Daedric artifacts, it has fallen into and slipped from the hands of many heroes throughout history, and while powerful, the Ogma Infinium was created by Xarxes, who himself distilled the knowledge granted by Mora before it was committed to the page. The Black Books, on the other hand, well, they're an entirely different beast. 
The black books were created by Hermaeus Mora himself, tomes of forbidden knowledge, some bearing secrets of an ancient past, others possessing knowings of a far-off future. We only know of snippets of actual text contained within, but what we have read is rather thought-provoking. The black book Waking Dreams says, the eyes once bleached by falling stars of utmost revelation will forever see the faint insight drawn by the overwhelming question, as only the true inquiry shapes the edge of thought. The rest is vulgar fiction, attempts to impose order on the consensus mantlings of an uncaring godhead. This is possibly a reference to the Middle Dawn, the longest dragon break to ever occur, an event caused by the metaphysical meddling of the Marikadi selectives in the First Era who desired to see the elven elements stripped from Akatosh. For those unaware, a dragon break is an event where time splits into multiple timelines containing contradictory events, but at its end, time is fixed once more into a singular stream. However, this results in a somewhat paradoxical world. One such example is the Miracle of peace, the events that occurred at the end of the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall where the Numidium was reactivated. Multiple endings and outcomes of different timelines were reconciled in an event known as the Warp in the West. That aside, this is what happened in the Middle Dawn, according to the book Where Were You When the Dragon Broke. The Council has collected texts and accounts from all its provinces, and they only offer stories that never coincide save on one point. All the folk of Tamriel, during the Middle Dawn, in whatever when they were caught in, tracked the fall of the eight stars, and that is how they counted their days. So to me, the falling stars of utmost revelation in the Black Book may be referring to the falling stars of the Middle Dawn. In the same book, in Manamako's account, he says, as for myself, I was here and there and here again, like the rest of the mortals during the dragon break. How do you think I learned my mystery? The Marikati selectives showed us all the glories of the dawn, so that we might learn simply, as above, so below. What's interesting is that Manamako says he learned his great mystery during the middle dawn dragon break, which falls in line with what the Black Book says. The eyes once bleached by falling stars of utmost revelation will forever see the faint insight drawn by the overwhelming question, as only the true inquiry shapes the edge of thought. So to explain more simply, by experiencing the middle dawn, or in more poetic words, to have your eyes bleached by falling stars of utmost revelation, he learnt that from the glories of the dawn, as in the dawn era, as above, so below. This is a quote you may be familiar with within our real world. You may have seen it on a book about tarot cards, but there is a school of thought, a Western esoteric tradition called Hermeticism, the very same I brought up earlier when speculating on Hermaeus's name. Within it is contained many different principles, an important one being as above, so below, which in essence is explaining the idea that what goes on in higher planes of existence, as above, corresponds with what goes on in lower planes of existence, so below. So to translate this into Elder Scrolls terms, the outcomes in Mundus, the mortal plane, and the outcomes in the more ethereal spiritual planes, let's just call that the God's plane, both correspond, meaning that what a mortal does in their life will affect what happens to the gods. This principle could be taken to a literal extreme of butterfly effect proportions, or rather it could be extrapolated to denote the importance of mythology. It shows how by worshipping or not worshipping gods affects their power, which in turn affects the ability of those gods to influence mortal affairs. As above, so below. If you erase the idea of Talos, for example, god of empire and men, then Talos will less be able to influence the world for the betterment of empire and men, so therefore they end up corresponding. It's a microcosm-macrocosm dynamic. Anyways, moving on, the rest of the Black Book text says, The rest is vulgar fiction, attempts to impose order on the consensus mantlings of an uncaring godhead. Now, if you're familiar with any of our metaphysical discussions on the Elder Scrolls, well then you may have heard me mention the idea that the entire universe exists within the mind or dream of an unknowable entity called the Godhead. Interestingly, this particular Black Book is also called Waking Dreams. Regardless, in typical understandings of Elder Scrolls metaphysics, when an individual comes to a great revelation, about the godhood, they essentially go one of two ways. They zero sum, which is to realize you are not real, can't cope and rationalize yourself out of existence. The other is to achieve Kim, which is to, despite the existential truth, be able to maintain your sense of ego, individuality, and your very existence. People have likened Kim to lucid dreaming, where you can exercise control over the dream, aka the universe in this case, hence be a god essentially. These concepts
concepts are important to understanding the Tribunal God Vivek, but the takeaway here is in relation to the Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora. In his black books, there is contained a knowledge of a terrifying existential truth, which A, fits into the whole cosmic horror Lovecraftian theme he has, and B, indicates and supports the truth of the statements that Mora is an Erdra, one of the most ancient princes with great understandings of the nature of the Orbis, the universe. Now, all this can be gleaned from a single passage available in a single black book, but this is because the reading experience for most is far more physical than one would usually like. Upon reading, inked tentacles burst from the page and enrapture your body, sending your soul to Mora's realm of Apocrypha, while your physical body remains on Tamriel. If you were to die there, you would simply return to your body. You must navigate the gauntlets of Mora, defeating his lurkers and seekers and puzzling halls, and if successful, you are rewarded with the true powers and insight that the Black Books offer. Now, one can imagine that in reality, this is simply far more engaging gameplay than reading a book to get a power or buff, and perhaps the navigation of the gauntlets and facing adversaries is an allegory for the complexities that the mind must navigate in order to truly grasp the knowledge. It's a fun little headcanon to have, but it's weird to imagine that the last Dragonborn's defeat of Mirak happens with a battle of their minds while the Dragonborn's physical body remains on Tamriel and snared by a book. The powers and abilities gained from the Black Books are actually quite useful, or at the very least provide nice flavor, but interestingly, the aforementioned book Waking Dreams, the one that contains the passage about the stars and the uncaring godhead, well, this is the book that within you defeat Mirak. And it is the book that allows you to reset your perk points, which are refunded at the cost of a dragon soul. That is to say, in lore terms, that the last dragonborn has the ability to use souls of dragons he has slain in order to shape his very own body, at will, transmuting himself into a specialist swordsman, or a crackshot archer, or a master mage. Of course, the underlying skill experience has to be there, but to be able to, at the cost of a dragon soul, turn yourself from an experienced archer into the greatest sniper the world has ever seen is quite the power. The self-molding potential here is astounding, truly making the last dragonborn of demigod proportions, yet one that could be as strong as Hercules one day and with the cost of a few dragon souls have the guile of Odysseus in the next. There are some great lore implications here, and it really does show how powerful the last Dragonborn is, considering he has the dragon aspect, Ben Will and Dragon Ren shouts as well, but the truly important question here is, what does Hermaeus Mora want with these dragon souls? Is this somehow a ploy, where the last Dragonborn to serve his own power hunts dragons and spends his souls in Apocrypha, which one could assume puts them right into the hands of its ruler, Hermaeus Mora? We know by the words of Parthenax that dragons are immortal children of Akatosh, specially attuned to the flow of time. Perhaps this is why Hermaeus Mora desires their souls. Perhaps this is why he has always been interested in a Dragonborn as a champion. Perhaps the dragon souls, attuned to the flow of time, allow him to better ascertain the futures and pasts, yielding him even greater insights when scrying the tides of fate. Whether you buy into the theory that Hermaeus Mora could have been the one to give Mirak the Dragonborn status via his knowing of the future covenant to be made with Akatosh, or whether you enjoy the more generally accepted idea that Mirak was blessed by Akatosh for the same purpose as the last Dragonborn would be to end Alduin's tyranny, Either way, Hermaeus Mora has always been interested in having a Dragonborn champion. At first, it was Mirak, whom he gifted the knowledge of the Bend Will Shout and his relic, the First Blade, more commonly known as Mirak's Sword, a green blade of tentacles that extends to reach targets and drain them of their stamina, a writhing blade of Apocrypha. With these gifts, Mirak slew many dragons and absorbed their souls in his ambitions, and I wonder if it was because he was using these dragon souls not only to further his understanding of the Thum, but also to trade with Hermaeus Mora in return for the capacity to shape himself, making him a master at any skill he wished. Total knowledge. After all, you face Mirak at the very spot where you can later spend Dragon Souls to reset your skill trees. Perhaps this is why Mirak was saved by Hermaeus Mora when he nearly died in a battle with Valak the Jailer, because the Daedric Prince desires a Dragonborn, a vessel which will willingly bring him the souls of dragons. When facing Mirak in battle, he can say, I am done being Hermaeus Mora's pawn. And of course, when defeated, Mirak is struck with the tentacle of Mora as he tries to escape, and this interaction takes place. Get to think to escape me, Mirak. You can hide nothing from me here. No matter. I 
have found a new dragon born to serve me. May he be rewarded for his service, as I am. <sighs> Mira, harbor fantasies of rebellion against me. Learn from his example. Serve me faithfully, and you will continue to be richly rewarded. Hermaeus Mora seems to specifically desire a Dragonborn. Both Mirak and the last Dragonborn were or are mere tools for him. Tools with which he can access Dragon Souls keenly attuned to the flow of time, with which he could theoretically ascertain more knowledge of past, present, and future. And depending on what you think of the metaphysical nature of dragons, these Dragon Souls could quite literally be pieces of the Akka Oversoul that encompasses all the various shards and pieces of the Time God. Pieces that perhaps Hermaeus Mora seeks to collect for his own ends. Just to make it clear, that last little bit of speculation is based upon some already abstract but popular fan theories based upon unofficial sources by Kirkbride. However, following this train of thought, it makes sense. Hermaeus Moro, who so greatly craves ultimate knowledge and ruthlessly does whatever he can to acquire that which he does not have, as is in the case with the Skull Tribe on Solstheim, is likely frustrated by the tides of fate, which ebb and flow with possibility, keeping him from total omniscient knowing. And perhaps that is why he seeks a Dragonborn, so that he can be manipulated into serving him and providing him with Dragon Souls so that he can claim more pieces of the Time God, hence literally gaining more control over time. And with the more control he has over time, the closer he can become to total omniscience with all events determined and recorded by him, finally satisfying his desire for complete knowledge. Man, theory crafting is fun. Take all that with a grain of salt though, but I think it's worth thinking about. The last Dragonborn could be in some very serious strife, and the allure of power might just turn them into a tool for Mora's own end, but who can say for sure what will happen there? I'd love to hear your thoughts on the matter in the comments below, but before we bring this long video to an end, let's discuss one other fun tidbit of information. The whole X Daedra is an enemy of Y Daedra is rather old lore drawn from the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall faction system. Most Daedric princes, for example, are seen as enemies of Ebon Arm, a god which hardly has any recognizability in modern Elder Scrolls titles, despite some allusions to and speculative apparitions of, like the Ebony Warrior. However, still these facts of previous titles are interesting to draw upon, and aside from Ebon Arm, only one Daedric prince is counted among Hermaeus Mora's enemies, and that is Veamina, the Daedric prince of dreams and nightmares. The Dreamweaver. I believe there is some clear reasoning as to why this is the case. Hermaeus Mora is the Daedric Prince of Knowledge, what was, what is, and what will be. Vaymina, on the other hand, is directly opposed to this. Her sphere is that of fantasy, of possibility, of omens, of what could have been, what could be, what might be. Hers is the realm of dreams, the antithesis of reality, of knowledge, so to say. They are simply fundamentally opposed, and I think that's a little neat bit of info. To summarize a Daedric Prince that is, I quote, the riddle unsolvable, the door unopenable, the book unreadable, the question unanswerable, is a rather difficult endeavor, but I can try to wrap up what we have discussed and speculated today. Hermaeus Mora is an Erdra, old antecedent, one of the oldest Daedric Princes among the likes of Namira, Nocturnal, and Mephala. Consistently, his motive is the acquisition of knowledge, constantly scrying the tides of fate. However, he has two interesting thematic interpretations. The first and most common is that of the aquatic. He presents himself as an inked mass of tentacles centered by an eye like that of a cuttlefish. His statue presentations often depict crustacean features and grotesque masses of tentacles and eyes. His realm of apocrypha is an inky sea with Daedric servants like lurkers and seekers, and according to his cultists, the primeval seekers, water is the repository for all memory in Mundus, and hence the aquatic theme for Hermaeus Mora makes a lot more sense considering that memory is the experienced form of knowledge. The secondary thematic interpretation is that of the Nords and the Bosma. To them, he is the Woodland Man, a trickster spirit hungry for secrets and knowledge. However, the Bosma do not recognize him as Daedra like the Nords do. It's a strange case of quite distinct cultures coming to a rather similar interpretation of an entity. Also refer back to the section where there were some neat little connections with the Morag Tong via his brother system of Fala, and both of these princes are tied to the elements of causality, a facet of the universe that is intrinsically connected with time, which is Akatosh, 
or whatever concept name you may use. But to build upon the connection with Akatosh, consider that all Hermaeus Mora's motives for acquiring both Mirak and the last Dragonborn as champions, and consider the Dragon Souls he requires in exchange for granting them certain power. Why does he want these Dragon Souls? And finally, consider that the Black Books possess knowledge of truly esoteric and abstract concepts within the Elder Scrolls universe, such as the Godhead. And so with this knowledge, we must recognize how close to omniscience Hermaeus Mora may be, and perhaps this is why he seeks Shards of Akka, that is to say, seek parts of the Time God, children of Akatosh, the Dragon Souls, so that he eventually could eliminate possibility and have total knowledge. Maybe. That was a wild ride. Thank you for joining me on it. The Daedric Princes are the best part of Elder Scrolls lore, and I'm excited to be delving into more of them like I did today. And I would ask of you to like the video in support of this content if you enjoyed it. Subscribe for more of these Daedric Prince explorations. I do plan on doing a full series. And please do comment below and contribute to the theory crafting and conversation. It's one of the greatest parts of the Elder Scrolls. There's so much room for interpretation and theory crafting and discussion. So let's get to it. Thank you all again so much for watching. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.